this is the official podcast of the WCD. There's a World Congress of Dermatology which will be held next in Singapore in 2023. I am Dr. Etienne Wang from the National Skin Centre of Singapore and I will be your host for this podcast. You can listen to us now in Season 2 and all our past episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts and wherever else you get your podcasts. In this podcast, I speak with dermatologists and skin researchers from all over the world to talk about all things dermatology. And today, my resident co-host Ellie is back with a dumb topic for discussion. What do you have for us today, Ellie? Hello. So today, I thought we could talk about... This- this whole idea of um, medical education. So I was reading the article that you sent me um, by Benjamin Planner published in JGDG and what the authors did was that they used 3D printing to create these silicon models that mimicked primary skin lesions. So things like papules, plaques, nodules, pustules, vesicles. And they gave these models to medical students to supplement their remote learning because with this limited patient contact due to COVID-19, they wanted a way for medical students to be able to really feel what these skin lesions are. That was quite interesting. I think in dermatology, it's such a visual, not only a visual, but a very tactile specialty as well. That's why every time we have students sitting in with us, we always get them to examine the patients up close. Yeah, correct. Um, and me from the study, they found that, you know, a large majority of students actually found this model and being able to feel the lesions helpful. Although, I mean, at this point, I'm not really very convinced about the true educational benefit of this model, considering that it's also probably going to be quite expensive to produce whether it's really beneficial over and above just seeing pictures or videos of skin lesions, or eventually when the students are going to have patient physical contact. Yeah, I thought this was a very good example of the new edu tech for for medical education. Do you have some examples that you came across? Yeah, so um, something that's actually being piloted in in US, our local medical school, it's this idea of mixed reality. So what they have is a HoloLens, it's this smart glasses kind of headset that you wear, and it projects a 3D holographic image. And this image can be used for things like anatomy teaching, or as a more realistic simulation for procedures like venipuncture and urinary catheter insertion. So I looked at the videos, and it's really quite cool, it's very interactive. You can click things on a hologram image, and can really interact with the virtual uh, image in a real environment. So that's something that's very interesting. And apart from, you know, in medical school, on a side note, also being piloted in our actual hospitals, where they use it to supplement uh, surgeries and pre-op planning. Wow, and are you developing anything for dermatology education with this tool? We're not, but it is something that I think it's worth uh, looking into. Number one, education, but number two, another area that I thought would be interesting would be this idea of teledermatology, because if you could get the HoloLens to uh, a patient's house, then that would make the teledermatology consult more beneficial, because I understand the image that uh, you can see um, using the HoloLens actually is a lot clearer than what you can see on video or photographs. Yeah, and they also use like the LiDAR technology and the depth perception to give you a sense of a 3D image of the rash or the tumour or the nodule, right? Yeah, so I think it's really exciting. I think, you know, in the next few years, you're probably going to see it more being implemented in clinical practice. I mean, right now, a lot of it's still in the piloting phase. Yeah, that's going to be the dermatology in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, all these are very high-tech and very interesting, but there are a lot of technologies and means that we can enhance medical education without these. Like, for example, um, there's this idea of gamification and game-based learning that we already use here at National Skin Centre. Like, for our dermatology resident teaching, um, sometimes we have things like uh, having points, leaderboard, prizes, challenges. All these are easy things that we can introduce to make learning more fun and interactive. Yeah, I think there are a lot of tools out there for education and and to help to improve our teaching methods. All right, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Ellie, thank you again for this topic and this discussion, and I'll see you next time. No problem, see you soon. Okay, bye. Bye. And now I'd like to welcome to the podcast, Professor Lydia Rudnicker. She's the chairman of the Department of Dermatology at the Medical University of Warsaw and the president of the Polish Dermatological Society. She was the first president of the International Society of Trichoscopy and the author of countless articles and books, including the Atlas of Trichoscopy. In fact, she invented the whole term trichoscopy in 2006. Isn't that right, Lydia? Yes, that, that, that was actually my idea because I thought that we really need a term for evaluation of hair and scalp disorders uh, with dermoscopy and to uh, allow not mixing up two more uh, examinations with hair examinations, I invented the the term uh, or I coined the term trichoscopy. 
Yes, I mean, dermoscopy has been such a mainstay in investigation of pigmented lesions and uh, skin tumours, but it's also super important in hair. I mean, in fact, in my practice, I use it for every single hair patient that walks in and I try to make my residents do it as well. How do you think trichoscopy has been taking off in the dermatological community around the world? You know, I I think it depends. Uh, I really observe that uh, many more dermatologists are using trichoscopy now than it was uh, even a few years ago. I remember a conference when I was asking, uh, this was I think around maybe 10 years ago, I was asking in a big room of approximately 600 people, who of you is using trichoscopy? And there were two hands uh, raised. And now almost the whole room uh, is uh, raising their hands and saying they're using trichoscopy. So, so I think it is getting popular. However, I have the feeling it is popular in many countries, but some countries uh, are, are still reluctant to use trichoscopy. What do you think is the most useful thing for trichoscopy in hair diseases? I think the most useful thing is really a very fast differential diagnosis. Even if we need to uh, confirm the diagnosis sometimes with other examinations and sometimes with the biopsy, still we get the first impression within the first second of putting the dermoscope against the scalp of the patient. And I'm really fascinated by this because this made a huge change in my clinical practice. Mm, same here. In fact, I, I feel that trichoscopy is really, really useful for telling us how active alopecia areata is and how well treatment has been working in the patient. That's true. And I think the nice thing about trichoscopy is that you see the improvement before the patient is cl- seeing it clinically. So you can uh, say, I see the hair regrowth. You will see it in one month or in two months. And this makes usually the doctor and the patient happy. Yeah, and I usually like to take some photos and show the patient as well because I think they really like the close-up looks of their scalp sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, I think uh, patients generally like being examined. They feel that an examination uh, means a lot more compared to just a simple look by the doctor. Maybe it's an it lacks of an understanding that we were uh, trained uh, for many years to. observe many things which other people do not see, even if they're also looking with their eyes. Uh, So uh, I think the examinations make the patients happy. Uh, And I also like uh, performing trichoscopy also for for this reason. Yeah. Uh, Your other interests include um, systemic sclerosis and other inflammatory diseases. What, What do you think are the more important things in this field these days? Well, I think in systemic sclerosis, this was the first field of my interest when I was a very, very young doctor. And I think the main problem is systemic sclerosis is that we still lack a very good treatment. In some diseases such as psoriasis and also coming up with the JAK inhibitors in alopecia areata, I think we are seeing a very rapid development in the possibilities of treating many dermatological diseases, whereas in systemic sclerosis still the possibilities are limited. Of course, we learned over time that the the vascular treatment or improving the microvasculature is uh, of uh, highest importance and it has to be introduced early and it saves many patients from uh, ulcers. But still, I think we are looking forward to some uh, breakthrough in terms of treatment of systemic sclerosis. Uh, have you tried using JAK inhibitors for systemic sclerosis? Uh, we have some experience with tofacitinib, but uh, I think um, it's uh, less of an effect uh, than expected. What is your, uh, what is your experience? I actually have very few systemic sclerosis patients, mm-hmm. but I have come across some papers which suggested that JAK inhibitors might be useful. So I was just curious about your experience. Yes, uh, we, we did try tofacitinib in some patients. Uh, however, these were patients who were very refractory to, uh, to therapy. And mm-hmm. maybe this was uh, the reason why we are not so very satisfied. But also the JAK inhibitors as for now, they are very difficult to, for the patient to, uh, to get because uh, they're very expensive and there's no reimbursement for uh, off-label treatment, as, at least in our country. Yeah, so it's the same in Singapore. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I found very interesting is that you have uh, quite a semi-successful YouTube channel, uh, Lydia. <laughs> <laughs> 
I love I love my YouTube channel, of course not because uh, I uh, think it's so good, but it really gives me um, the time where I can relax and not think about work. It's it's really even though it's uh, it's related to dermatology and mainly to hair and trichoscopy, I love doing these YouTube videos because it's it's a it's a hobby, and and I really love doing it and I really enjoy if if someone uh, gives some feedback to indicating that they were watching the video that that's also very pleasant so so it it gives me some pleasure Yes, absolutely. I'm very passionate about science communication and public education as well, um, especially with all these new forms of communication, like, for example, YouTube, podcasts, and even like TikTok. Um, can I just ask, um, this is just to, for my own curiosity, uh -huh. do you do all your own editing and how do you plan a video for your YouTube channel? Uh, you know, uh, I am not professional at all. I do not plan. I plan. I do my editing. I do everything by myself. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a business. I don't hire a person to edit or a person to improve the audio or the video. I do it all my, by myself. I enjoy it a lot. And uh, it's, it's, as mentioned, it's a hobby. It's not a business. So, so it's not done professionally. It's uh, all my hobby. Well, congratulations. They're, uh, they're, they're very impressive and you have a very nice manner the way you speak. All the information comes out very smoothly and I enjoy your videos very much. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. You know, it's sometimes it's a lot of work. Sometimes I need to repeat twice or three times. So uh, the, sometimes the video looks better than, than the orig original. Of course, it always does. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you were in Singapore in 2016 for the Regional Congress of Dermatology. Can yes. I ask you about what your experience was in Singapore? I must say that it was an incredible experience. I love Singapore. Actually, I have been uh, in Singapore twice. Once because I was going, I was on my way back from Australia because Singapore is a is a, a connection point between Australia and Europe. And so I, I had the opportunity to be in Singapore. What I enjoyed a lot is is are the people. The people are extremely nice, and I really have spent a great uh, time with. Uh, talking to the dermatologists, but also talking to other people. Uh, the food is extremely good. And uh, what I can recommend, because I imagine that some people who are uh, listening to us right now will be joining the World Congress of Dermatology in 2023. So what you need to try in Singapore is the chocolate uh, tea. I have not uh, seen it anywhere in Europe or in America and in other countries. It's really best of the best. So, uh, so this is one of the things to try. <laughs> We must definitely get some some of that for you when you're in the WCB uh -huh. next year. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am sure I will come and I will be happy to, to come. And yes, and what are you looking forward to most uh, other than the chocolate tea um, uh -huh. for the WCB in 2023? You know, I know that uh, the people in Singapore are just incredible organizers and uh, I'm sure that this will be a wonderful congress extremely well organized and I'm sure it will be more modern than the congresses we usually attend. So if you want to see a congress of the future, uh, you need to join the congress in 2023 in Singapore. Oh, thank you. Thank you for all the praise, Lydia. All right. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Yes, and I hope to see you very soon. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that was the official podcast of the WCD. Don't forget to follow us on all our socials on Facebook, Instagram at WCD2023 Singapore, and check out our WCD website, WCD2023Singapore.org for more updates and content on the WCD. And until next time, stay safe and use sunblock.